and a job in writing. And one thing I've learned about the two professional writers is that it's a job. And that it's, it's a fairly hard job. Easy in some respects, it's indoors and there's no heavy lifting. But very hard in another respect, in that it's never ending. <laughs> it's something which you can always tinker with. When Terry writes, when I first met Terry, 30 or 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago, uh, he was becoming quite famous. But his work pattern hadn't changed. He was still writing like a journalist. And, and like a journalist, he wrote very quickly. He absolutely, in, in, almost insisted that there was noise going on. He would have music going on uh, all the time because he said he'd worked for so many decades in newsrooms um, where it was very noisy, where there was a clatter of machinery, where it was in a newspaper, and, and he needed that around him. It didn't distract him, if anything. It, was, it, it acted as a little bit of a, 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 a movement. It, it, it created the atmosphere. Um, and I've seen him uh, write just literally in the days when he was typing. And he'd be talking to you, and then he'd go and do their part, and then it'd be blah, 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 blah. And, and words would appear on the screen. Sorry, I haven't got anything to be sorry about, but you're buying the drinks later on. <laughs> <laughs> so he would be writing, and um, I'd be trying to look over his shoulder. In those days, he only had two screens. Now, I think, uh, it's four screens, isn't it? Six. 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 Oh, sorry, <coughs> but in those days, it was just a couple of screens, and so there would be that he'd be writing away, and uh, I've actually seen him. So he'd read, 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 read something out, you go, well, that's, that's bloody good. Yeah, it's too good for this book. And with a cut and paste, it would go off to another screen. He said, there's another book in that. <laughs> and, and so he would then carry on. And, and people would be chatting to him, he'd be going, I said, I might see you, he might see you. And I would go, and it, and it was something which I said to him, on many occasions, it, what comes first? The story, the idea, or is it the dialogue? And, and it, he writes in voices. And he'll have a conversation with himself in voices. And uh, certainly when he's developing a new character, when, uh, and the one that comes to mind is Lu Tsai, the, the, uh, from the history monks. When he, he, you can see Terry, we know him as we all do, you can see Terry in, in many of the characters he's writing about. There's aspects of his uh, character, aspects of his life in there. Um, and Lutzai is, is that the sweeper, the small guy who gets in, gets on with it, just sweeps up, puts it up. Now that, very much in context with what his life was as a newspaper reporter. We, we shared, although we were many counties apart, we shared a point in time doing a similar job. He was a reporter on a, on a daily rag. I was a coroner's officer, a uniformed officer, which is for, for those who are not conversant with it. It's a uniform officer um, provided by a, the police force of a given county uh, to assist the coroner who has uh, himself a job which is almost as old as the sheriff. It, 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 it's, it is one of the great uh, office, offices of state is a coroner. He can describe whether somebody is, has been killed uh, accidentally, whether somebody has been killed uh, purposely, whether a death is legal, whether a death is illegal, whether there is treasure trove, all those sorts of things. And he has a uniformed officer appointed to him who has a power of arrest. The coroner has not got a power of arrest. That was taken away from the 1700s, but a police officer has. And a police officer also has a trunch and he can hit people with it. You know, <laughs> so there was me, as a coroner's officer, dealing with all sorts of interesting ways that people choose to die. And there was Terry, as a newspaper reporter, reporting on how interesting things is way to die. And it's interesting that in this room, there's a man who, I don't know whether it was at that time or a little bit later, was then taking the bits of meat that used to be people, 
and seeing quite how they died, and that bit weighed that much, and all good heavens, I'd like a kidney like that. Is that right, Dave? <laughs> Happy day. We, 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 <laughs> we, we all, we've all, <laughs> we're part and parcel of this. Now, Terry, well, he's, of course, as a journalist, writing quickly, writing succinctly, um, getting the message across, and, and that's as his skill as a writer. Anne McCaffrey um, was a totally different ball game. <coughs> Anne McCaffrey took up writing uh, to, to feed her children. Um, there she was, suddenly living back in Ireland. She was a single parent again. I think she had three children in those days. And um, she always wanted to tell stories. And so um, her first really well-published novel was The Ship Who Sang, which for those of us, I'm sure most of us have read it, was absolutely totally revolutionary in science fiction terms, it had a female lead. Yeah, absolutely, in the 70s, that was you know so far out, it was unbelievable. And there it is, this wonderful book, The Ship That Sang, which is well before her Pern series. Now, I knew her when she was writing, she was really well into the Pern, and she was running out of steam. She really was, she said, I'm running out of steam, I still have the stories. But I'm, I'm getting tired. So she took uh, co-authors. Now Terry's never ever done that. There's a few of us that have been privileged enough to produce scaffolding research for Terry, but it is only research. He is the writer. And Anne's way of writing was very much that she went into her office, her studio, and she sat at a typewriter, she still used a typewriter, and in some cases it was one hand in a yellow a legal pad. And she, she delved into her skill as a storyteller, painting in the colours, the palette, I should say, of her creations, of her characters and putting them into different situations uh, and moving the situation, moving the character and evolving the character. I never heard her speak in voices. Uh, and I, would never, I would never put them side by side or say one is better than the other. But there's no doubt about it, when you read Terry's work, there is such a rich tapestry of, of characters that come through and talk to you. And read about. And I'm sure that's because um, Rob Wilkins once said, Rob Wilkins is Terry's PA, he once said, Terry listens like a Uber. <laughs> and Terry does, he actually listens. And, um, and uh, I shall say at the game through this weekend, he would have been here today, uh, this weekend, had it not been a three line whip from the. Uh, Come on in, darling heart. Ah, darling. But you've got to be prepared to share the drink. <laughs> We're talking about writing. It's not that I could do much of it. I've written on lavatory walls. I once, years ago, I, was, I did a little brief in an art college, and, and uh, uh, it was the Slade School of Art, in, in, and um, it was in Whitechapel. And um, the Whitechapel Gallery, lovely gallery to go into, wonderful in those days. And then there was some like, the children's museum. Whitechapel's a real rough end these days of London. It really is a a toss pot edits, it's, it's quite dangerous and edgy. And there was one of the old under fashion, uh, uh, underground lavatories, Uranus. All white tiles. And, and you went sort of down, it was near Whitechapel tube station, you went down into this, this Victorian Edwardian great cavern where you could have a pee. And, and it was all sort of old and grotty and, and there was um, the sort of uh, uh, huge urinal came down, and then there was the stalls all the way around, and it was all mahogany and white tile. And uh, some third year students who were really quite naughty and quite clever, they decided that graffiti should become an art form. And over the course of a, a long weekend, they put the Sistine Chapel ceiling in felt tip pens. And felt tip pens had <laughs> just come out. They were quite expensive, but in felt tip pen, the Sistine Chapel ceiling with the hand of God and the hand of Adam meeting over this great urinal. <laughs> it was so wonderful. 
but you couldn't pee. <laughs> you know, you're standing there, like, and thinking, I, you know, because the finger, so nobody, <laughs> nobody used the scent of bay, you know? Uh, not that you do, because it's men in your eyes, it's a funny thing, you never stand next to anybody you know, you always stand next to them down, and up. there's all these sort of protocols to go on. And, and, and then you went into one of the, the cubicles, and, and they'd, they'd done a bit from Dante's Inferno. <laughs> And it wasn't a very clean loo, you know, this is London, not very clean loo, and almost had that interesting earthy smell, that <laughs> smell. And so there you were, so sort of, you didn't want to go in there, not certainly with Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Unless you had a good curry, in which case, it was very apposite. But, so you go, well, well, going back to, um, yeah. So, writing. I know a person who, uh, who um, was asked to provide background on a book and took it a little bit seriously and started to really hammer the words together. And she really got into the project. And I said to a good friend of mine, I said, you know, she's really got the bit between the teeth on this one, I'll say. Yes, he said, I knew she would. Crafty little fucker. So, anyway, we left her at it. And she produced a bloody good, made a bloody good fist of producing more than just a scaffolding. More than just a scaffolding of a children's book. And it went across to Terry. And he read it, and he said, well, it's not bad. It's not bad. Now you need to do the second draft. So this person, Elizabeth, she said, <laughs> second draft? God, yes. Oh, my God, yes, he said. The first draft of anything you write, ends up in the bin. But it gives you the way to travel. It gives you enough to build the second draft on. And so Isabel went back, was charged to write the second draft. And she did the second draft and she measured how much worm poo is produced or the spoil of such worm poo that the worm cast. She, she weighed everything out, she researched all about worms, she researched all about poo, she did all bits and pieces. In the meantime, a guy called Peter Dennis was doing the illustrations from, well, and there's Terry sitting almost like the editor, the head teacher. And then the manuscript comes through. And he reads it, he says, that, 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 we'll move that there, I think that ought to go in there, or oh, let's do this, that, and the other gives us a chunk of the most glorious Pratchettism, puts that there, they're going to do it again. <laughs> the third draft was done, and he said, now it's becoming a book. He said, and that's how it works. You rush off. You ram it down, you put it down, you put your words down, you get your images down, you talk with the voices, you get the whole thing. Then, you throw it up, throw it up, put it in the bin, and start again. But you've got your bedrock, you've started it. And I, I've learned so much, I, uh, I've admired the man for years, he's been a friend and, and, and a good mate. When winter comes, you know what trees are evergreen, and he's been a bloody good evergreen tree to me, and Isabel. And I, I've always admired him, obviously, as we all do, because we're here. And some of us have spent good money getting here, so we really <laughs> fucking mean it, don't we? You know, but we, we like his work. It's, it's, we, we live it. I'd never realised how hard it was until really getting into the nitty-gritty, to the meaty bit of what is a very small part of his canon, which is the world of poem. And, and it, it was such a revelation. And there's Isabel, who, like many of you in this room, is an academic by craft, by trade, by training, actually stretching out 
into, into producing words which make pictures in people's heads. And it, it was, for me, I, mean, I did Fagolsky, but it was, it was a very interesting exercise, a very interesting experience, and one which has, has prompted Isabel to start looking at other ways of, of doing it. And Terry, of course, was very happy with it at the end because he got the bread and bones done and he was able to pick apart what Isabel had produced and what I had added to, and then turn it into a jolly nice little book which hit number two. And it was lovely, and we got paid, and he did very well, you know. And, but it was such an interesting exercise. The stuff we're gonna, I'll talk about later in the weekend is the Atlas and, and, and the Complete Night Mall books. It's like a different ball game entirely. I said, that, that, is, that is almost scholarship in, in terms of how everything is put together, if scholarship could be. But it was such an interesting exercise to see the Book of Pooh come to life. Um, and the work it took, it, several days of doing this, several days of doing it, several days of having it thrown, of throwing it away. He didn't tear it right away. But Terry said to us, but no, I, I think you, yeah, this is how it works, Isabel. Throw it away <laughs> and do it again. Because it's in your head, it's in your heart, and now it ought to be in your hands, but now you're going to join the bits and pieces together again. And, and it was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. I, I, and I, I never knew uh, Anne McCaffrey well enough, but I have a feeling, I've spoken to other, I've spoken to editors um, uh, in Trance World, and uh, there's, there's a wonderful lady there um, who, discovered, who has discovered some quite serious, well, I say serious is the wrong word, um, Lee Childs. There's, there's several of Lee Charles' books are, are, are dedicated to this lady. Um, she's his editor. And I, when I said, we were sitting at a pub, I think, or restaurant, I said, well, how do you get on? You know, how do you, how did you? She said, the manuscript came in, I read it. Uh, this is Marion Bellman. So you think about Marion, didn't you, Transworld? So. Lady called Marion Bellman. Lovely lady, real tough cookie. Jesus Christ, she's a tough cookie. Shake hands and you've got to count your fingers because she's a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's jolly interesting that she said that it, you get an editor to work with a writer and it's a symbiotic relationship. And there is a lot of tussling will go on as to whether that piece should be edited out or that she should be putting in. Or in some cases, whether or not the writer has lost his way as far as the plot's concerned. Often happens, get too close to it and can't see it. And in some ways, there is a correlation between that process, the process of writing and creating images in words and creating a piece of sculpture. I, I, I can't say that painting, it, I'm sure it is, because I'm not a painter, I don't know the discipline that well. But I do know, as far as sculpture is concerned, but, and, and certainly portrait sculpture, anything you're doing um, in three-dimensional form, you start off creating the basic block, the basic shapes, looking at the way that space around an object interacts with the object, making sure that the balance, the structure is, is right, is there. And then you build on that. Uh, and you redefine it. In many cases, it means that you almost throw away the first thing you've done and you're working on the second thing. And I think that's where the, the, the whole creative process is one that is, is where you're testing yourself, you're testing what you're producing, and, and what you're doing is, is you're, prepared, you're prepared to destroy it to make it better next time, to build on it. And you're quite prepared to go back to ground zero, to work on it and to bring it out. And I think this is where an author of Terry's stature, and even of his experience, and, and, and listening to him talk about Raising Steam, um, where he went to the wire, you know, on many of um, you the know, bits and pieces. I know there's bits that hit the cutting room floor, because we were drawing the bloody map. As he was writing, we were drawing the map of where the railway goes, and suddenly it didn't need to go there because that bit hit the cutting room floor. We went, oh, for Christ's sake. You know, no, not going there now. It doesn't work as far as the plot's concerned. You, know, oh you see, characters, which you've read in other books, shine up 
and become, you know, play a different role entirely and, and have a, an importance that they've never had before. And so you think, oh, well, 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 you know, this is, where's this going? And, and what's happening is, <coughs> like every good craftsman, he's chipping away. Some bits are hitting the deck, other bits are bolted on. It's a fascinating process. And it's not one I could do. I think it requires, uh, re re requires more courage than I've got. I can hack a bit of clay up. I can knock a bit of wood together. Um, but not, not writing. It's a, it's a black art. You write scientifically, don't you? Is it the same process? It's a lot more formulaic. There are sort of uh, approved ways of doing things. You don't have the the freedom. It's not about it's in, it's entirely about what you're saying and not how you're saying it. Whereas in most books, it's, it's how you say it. There are only so many basic plots. It's how you how you tell the story rather than what the story is. Right. And so that and so you say it's formulaic. I presume. I mean, yeah, in a scientific paper, and you've been published, both of you, I know, and there must be others here, but you've been, both been published. Is there a beginning, a middle, and an end? Very definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is there? And the ending is always, more research is needed, give me more money. They're now saying, don't. Don't end up with your conclusion more research is needed. We're fed up reading. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Yeah. Has anybody else done any writing? Anybody else here write? Yeah. What do you write? I um, write uh, comic books, but I also write normal books too. You write comic books? Yeah. That's a black art, isn't it? Because you've got are you writing the dialogue in boxes or, or do you write the story first and the and the and the illustrator carries on or, or how do you do it well i um sort of like do it in speech bubbles and all that you right know? so you you've got to cut everything down yeah i mean you've got what a tiny bit of space you've got room for four, four or five words or exclamation marks that's not like one of them <laughs> And, and is this fantasy or is this an uh, action hero? Or? Um, it's not like a bit of, bit of, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but That'd it's, it's not like a bit of uh, fantasy and a uh, bit of sci-fi and a bit right. of real life rolled into one. It's, it's a nice one. mixtures of things. Anybody else? Who's done some art? 